once in a while. Helps a lot if you're out to see things and gauge things real fast like. It's the best way I know to get good fast reaction. Oh, I love to just piss people off. <laughs> so off they went to Poverty Flat. Well, I was enjoying life on our Poverty Flat homestead. My brothers, uh, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I don't know. But my mother was having no part of it. She figured that the pioneering should have been done by somebody else a long time ago. My old man, he was trying to keep things together, so he makes a deal with Jim Cashman, a searchlight, to lease the old searchlight ferry, the Aravada. She was quite the tub, the old Aravada, 41 feet long, 10 feet wide, powered by an old locomobile engine. She had a tunnel stern, and she rode across the Colorado on one foot of water if she could find it. She crossed cars, teams, wagons, horses, sheep, anything that had the fare. But she could only handle the car by letting its wheels hang over the side. She wasn't much, but she was enough to put us in the ferry business. The fact there wasn't much business, and the fact that the last ferryman had starved to death, didn't seem to bother my old man at all. Anyway, it was only a matter of a short while before I'm the ferryman because Pop's already over the mountain looking for greener homesteads. After a couple of years of homesteading on Poverty Flat and operating the ferry, things got a little too dull for Dad. He got bored. Mother wanted no part of either ferry or homestead. She was sick of them both and wanted to live in town. And my brothers, they weren't very smart. They needed more schooling. So my mother moved into Searchlight and got a house and put my brothers in school. My dad and I stayed down on the river. I managed to convince them that I already had all the book learning I needed. I was a real smart boy, I told him. <laughs> Besides, I, I already was 15 years old and full grown and you can't waste time sitting at a school desk at that right old age. Not with all the things there are to do and places to go. And after all, somebody had to run the ferry. Well, he ran that ferry for years. A lot of his customers were bootleggers or carrying stuff over into chloride from Nevada. <clears throat> by and by he tried a few other trades. He tried cowboying, he didn't like that, he said, because he didn't enjoy getting his eyes gouged out in the bushes as much as he ought to. <coughs> he tried bootlegging, he tried moonshining, he tried just about everything you could think of, truck driving in the uh, trucks of those days. And finally he got run out of Arizona one more time for, for trying to sell illegal hooch, which they call white mule and was back in Nevada. He said, my dad and brother were high grading out on some little gold stringers near Searchlight. When I got back to Nevada, where I've ever, lived ever since, I found a letter from Al Jagers. He said, come up to Chloride and we'll build a boat. He had a yen and a weakness for the Colorado, but he didn't quite know how to approach it, so he sent for me. Well, that was fine by me. I hot-footed it right up there. His idea, he told me, was to build a big motorboat and take it up through Black Canyon and Boulder Canyons. I knew of one boat that had made it halfway up Black Canyon and a couple of the old stern wheel steamboats that had winched their way up over the rapids as far as the mouth of the Virgin River for salt. But no motorboat had ever made it all the way up. Well, that was the kind of trip for me. I had just turned 18 and I was raring to go. After a couple of months' work, we finished our boat and launched her. She was a beauty, 30 feet long and 6 feet wide, built of 1x12s, 2x4s, candle wicking, nails, hot tower, powered by an old four-cylinder local wheel truck engine with a propeller mounted in a tunnel stern for protection in shallow draft. She drew 12 inches and had a top speed in the water of nearly 6 miles an hour. There was no trial. When we saw the motor boat return, saw the motor return the propeller, we just took off. The purpose of the trip was to go up to Gravel Wash and pick up Carl Hayden, the congressman then and later a senator for Arizona, and bring him down through the dam sites and show him what the river was all about. We had 100 miles to go in the summertime, and that was in our favor because it was daylight enough to run 16 or 17 hours a day. First day we made 20 miles, we were very pleased. Two or three years earlier, the old motorboat Virola had come up from Blythe into Black Canyon as far as Willow Beach to pick a load of uh, mining machinery, so I knew we wouldn't have too much problem that far. But since our top speed was five and a half or six miles an hour, and since the speed of the river in many places was more than that, sometimes it took a little maneuvering to make headway. 
And uh, he ends up learning the art of uh, working the currents, you know, getting in the slower current by the shore, punching out into the fast water and dropping over the other side, and uh, getting out, pushing, pulling, yanking, pulling, roping and dragging, and uh, just turning the motorboat on full blast. They both jump overboard and just push. And they got it up there. Uh, and all the way up, they kept running into these camps of people who were either prospectors. Some of them were uh, early uh, rock on tours who thought that they were going to build a dam somewhere. Uh, this one one gang called them the Stetson Gillette Mob. Was the the guy who owned Stetson Hat, the guy who owned Gillette Razors, and they were going to build their own dam. This is before Hoover Dam. Well, all these people saw this boat come by, and they hail them in and say. Where'd you get that thing? Are you for hire? We want you to work for us. And so all of a sudden, Merle Emery, 18 years old, king of Colorado, is uh, in demand. And he, he was actually pretty choosy about who he worked for, but he picked <clears throat> one after another of these guys and built better boats, better boats, finally got something he didn't have to drag, you know, and learned how to work these currents. And uh, I don't know if you ever read Mark Twain, he talks about memorizing all the sandbars in the Mississippi. <coughs> which are always moving. Well, he had to do the same thing on the Colorado, so he would learn all of this. And up and down, back and forth, and more and more of the government people are coming in now to, they're getting serious about, about building a dam. And Myrtle Emery's the only guy who can get him around. It was my job to take out parties of surveyors and engineers, set up camps for them and keep them supplied. I ranged all up and down the Colorado with men and freight, and since I hardly ever went the same place two days running, I liked the job just fine. For many years, it seemed like I was the only Colorado boatman who could or would travel great distances on the river. I had it all to myself, and strangely enough, it sometimes got me a little bit drunk. On the 60-mile run from the camp down to Bullhead, I had to pass seven different moonshine operations. <laughs> Well, it wasn't safe for a man to run his motorboat past a still without stopping to pass the time and taste the latest batch of white mule. The still operators were a jittery bunch, and if you passed them by, a little later they got raided by the feds, well, they'd naturally assume you turned them in. If you had to pass by them pretty often and didn't care to get shot, it was just good insurance to drop in and be friendly and collect a free sample. So on the way down the river, I had to stop seven times and drink rock gut. By the end of the day, 60 miles down the river, I might pile into a few sandbars, but generally by then I think it's pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> now here he is, one of his later contraptions, got a steering wheel in it and everything, his little captain's hat, he's doing pretty well. One of the fellows he worked for had a little airplane, they wanted him to learn to drive that, so he became a pilot. Flew that thing around, bouncing in and out of these camps until he finally crashed it. <coughs> and he uh, broke his hip pretty bad. And by the time he recovered from that, something was going south with his hip. It just kept getting worse and worse. And uh, he ended up going into LA where his mom and family had moved by then. And they took care of him and it got worse and they tried all kinds of things. And it turns out he had something I had never heard of tuberculosis of the hip bone. And it's a horrible thing. And should have killed him. But he, uh, he tried this and then he finally went on one of these fad diets of eating nothing but milk. He drank milk for like two years and he got better. But during that time he was immobilized. Uh, he was terribly weak. A lot of his muscles had atrophied and his hip bone really never worked right after that. So he was actually quite crippled.